We have um, Paul Kingsman from from uh, the US, South Carolina still. Yep, South Carolina. Yeah. And Philippa Langrell uh, from from uh, Cambridge, and Rod Dixon uh, from Nelson. So we 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 are triangulated across the the planet, and um, so so Paul, let me start it it in an unusual place, but it's probably the question that you get asked quite often. When you turned up to um, Seoul, uh, 1988, did you yep. know the Russians were going to swim underwater? I had a fair idea that the Americans were. David Burkhoff was was credited with originating going underwater. The the irony of the, the whole, for us, the swimming in, in Seoul Olympics was that the guy who won the 100 backstroke, Dachi Suzuki, the Japanese guy, was the first guy to do it back in 19, he was doing it in 1983 when we were swimming age group events down in Australia. Right. In fact, the reason how I know that is because after the heats of the men's 100 backstroke where my swimsuit came down, Daiichi was going under the water and he said he had to surface early because he started laughing because all he could see was my white butt at the, at the top of the water. So, yeah, Dachi was doing this uh, back as far as 1983. Um, and, and so Burkhoff was credited with it. Uh, but, yes, Suzuki was doing it uh, a little earlier on. I would say Burkhoff perfected it, yeah. Yeah, so when you when you went to Seoul and jumped in the heat, you, 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 yeah. you knew these two guys wouldn't do it for still. 10, 15 meters. So, so what happened for, for the kids and families who watch this a bit later on is that uh, it was just, was it two Russians? Yeah, well, Igor, so, so Igor did it in the 200 backstroke, but no one was really nailing it like that for the 200. Right. And because that was just, you know, you were expecting to, anyone who tried it, you would expect to die pretty, pretty poorly coming home. Uh, so he was, he certainly surprised everyone doing it. At the start of the 200, yes, yeah, right. Um, now, again, you, I think I've got my my records right, but New Zealand hadn't won an Olympic medal up until Seoul in the pool. Is that correct? Uh, in men's in men's, men's individual, sorry, men's men. men, yes, yeah, yeah. Constellation relay back in the back in the 20s with Malcolm Champion. Uh, but in an individual event, uh, no male had won one. Gene Hurring or Gene Stewart. Uh, one one I, I want to say Helsinki, but I don't don't quote me on that. Um, but Jean Stewart won one. She was the first um, first female to do it for New Zealand. Was it Helsinki for looking? And an amazing lane, Gary I'm Harrington. Wondering, I'm wondering if it was Melbourne, but I'm not sure. It was it, in the first. May have been. May have been Melbourne. Yeah, I'm it was. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it yeah, sounds a little bit like fine. the twins. The twins question, and I, I just didn't quite get time to look up the calendar. Who, who won the first one? You or Anthony Moss? Uh, I was. I won the first one. I was three days ahead of Anthony. Right. Uh, two days ahead of Anthony. Yeah. The men's men's two hundred backstroke was uh, was yeah two days ahead of the two hundred meters fly. Uh, so I got that just right. But but, but, but yeah, we were picking him. I mean, he swam just a phenomenal race in the two hundred fly, um, yeah. and. Yeah, he was. It was fun, fun watching that night for sure. Because he was sort of up against a superhuman too, wasn't he? Yeah, Mikel Gross. Uh, yes, uh, big wingspan, um, just a tough competitor. Uh, everyone knew th there were a number of Europeans that everyone had been watching coming into the uh, into those Olympics, and uh, yeah, Gross was was ready for that. Um, so yeah, but but Anthony put together a great swim. And there were some big names in that final. And there's big names in any Olympic final. There were some big names in, in his final. And um, he did a great job um, coming back with the bronze. Yeah. Oh, no, amazing. And, and I, I know it was, it was, it was riveting uh, to watch. You know, I, I tended to have a tradition of, of wagging any of my education. Uh, like, I, I think 1984 Olympics, I didn't go to school for a day <laughs> during, <laughs> during that time. Um, so yeah, I was supposed to be studying during 1988, but you know maybe a paper slipped by. <laughs> um, um, in in 1984, you would have gone as a um, 
speak tighter. And 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 Rod Dixon was there as, as an athlete, and I, I, I it was tremendously interesting. Um, that was your last Olympics, wasn't it, Rod? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I went, I, I went, I went with the Fiji Olympic team in '96 as a coach. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what were you coaching for Fiji? Uh, track and field. Okay. Track and, field. and um. Yeah, it was quite a, quite a journey. Incredibly to go up there, and uh, and sometimes I would go up there to uh, do uh, with the 400 meters, uh, 200, 400, and uh, I wanted one of the kids to do 1500 meters, but that was too far. He didn't want to run that far. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and one of the other times I went up was um, uh, I said, "Where are all the athletes?" He said, "Oh, well, uh, two of them are still on the island. They're working with their parents uh, harvesting." And another one doesn't want to come. So I said, well, what do I do? I said, well, just go back to the hotel and enjoy your time. <laughs> so it, was, it was very, very much Fiji time. Right. <laughs> so so Philip um, told us uh, when Lorraine came on, Lorraine Moller, um, about being being in the stands at Barcelona and and phenomenal watching her run in third. As a, as a, so you, were you only 17 in 84? when you went, went up there yes yes yeah, 17 and and yes my my la experience was that of a, a dumb teenage boy <laughs> so fortunately fortunately there was another one coming along four years time in 1988 but um yeah lost just lost focus and um didn't know at the time that i had mono was diagnosed a month or about six weeks after um but but still not to negate the silly dumb things that I did, you know, just out of sheer stupidity and inexperience. Uh, but fortunately, I had another go around four years later. Um, so, so just, 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 just as a, like a, I, if I, I hear what you're saying and blame yourself too much. I think my 17, 18 year olds would have, um, I assume responded to the restaurants that were free and all that sort of stuff. And, um, this one. <laughs> As a participant and, and, yeah. and slash spectator, you know, someone who's just involved in that experience, um, and I'm sure there's been changes, but but what are the Olympics like? And I guess all three of you can answer because, you know, my only chance is getting there as the, I've just heard that you can get there as a Fijian athletics coach, but uh, apart from that. <laughs> there's time yet, Alan. <laughs> 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 yeah so so what, what's what's the experience Philippa oh I mean, <clears throat> it's you really can't I mean well you can describe it but to really get the feeling of it it's very difficult to encapsulate that it's um you know just the sheer size of it you know you've got 10,000 athletes or more there um of course the city has been gearing up for it for probably a decade um, you walk in and, and, you know, the dining hall is huge. It can seat, you know, thousands of athletes. I remember walking into the dining hall in Barcelona and, you know, you go up to get a particular dish and um, you can have whatever you like. Um, and I turned to the left of me and I thought, oh, I know you. And, you know, when you recognize someone, but for me, it was recognizing them off the telly, and it was Boris Becker and Steffi Graf. And it was just such a, it's just such a shock. You know, you've got all of these superstars of, of, you know, global sport. And, um, you know, here I was sort of 20 years old and at my first Olympics or only Olympics, but um, it's, it's, it is a surreal experience. And it's very easy to see why people get, um, totally overwhelmed with it and um it's very easy to lose focus on your performance if you're not careful yeah what, what about for you rod because clearly that that, that mm. almost became a sojourn with the exception of sort of 1980 which is you know it's tremendously unfortunate um and 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 what's changed from 1972 to 1996 and beyond well it's, it's certainly 72 76 uh, Olympics were um, still very amateur. 
Um, and so we ne we didn't have any of the professional teams or any professional athletes. Um, the the IAAF or the Olympic Committee were very, very much onto uh, professional athletes even participating. So we didn't have that, um, uh, uh, what we would call um, factor in it. However, you know, going certainly to Munich, and that's 50 years ago, and I just, I still shake my head in 50 <laughs> years, wow. Um, and just think that, uh, uh, you know, going there and just being overwhelmed, it was like, you know, it really was. I mean, I went to Disneyland many, many years later, uh, but um, uh, Munich was like Wonderland. It was just unbelievable. I just couldn't believe it, how incredible it was and the athletes training and we learned very quickly not to go down there and train when all the top athletes were training because you were just overwhelmed by it all it was just too much and of course now and again somebody would say isn't that such and such and as soon as you call out their name they would run faster and I'm thinking <laughs> wow so what we used to go down and I used to go down and call out my competitor's name so they would run faster and leave it all on the track. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and for you, Paul, so 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 without without picking on your, your sort of 1984 experience, um I mean the, the things happen in Seoul as well. I mean, did did you manage to say so I'd love to know about your experience, but did you you didn't manage to be on the track or watching from the stadium when Lewis and Johnson uh did their thing? Uh, what, did, was I seeing that? Did you say? Yeah. So you would actually by that stage we'd left. Um, oh. Athletics is typically the last, um, you know, the last of the calendar, and we got out of there after the swimming had finished. Uh, I had the chance to get down to to Hong Kong with my coach, and my dad was there, and so we just had a couple of days in Hong Kong together. And and for us, for me at that point. The, the Olympics for me, September the 22nd was done. Um, and, and, and it was partly because of the experience in 84. Uh, where, where in 88, there was, there was just one day that, that, that I was focusing on. Um, you know, I didn't, any of the New Zealand gear or any of the, you know, the, the, the several pairs of shoes and all that kind of stuff just went straight under my bed. Whereas in 84, I wore the things, I got blisters, I got tired legs, all that kind of stuff. Um, 88 was, I, I'll never forget though, the opening ceremony in 88, 84 was like Disneyland. I like <laughs> Rod, Rod mentioning that term because it was like la la land. Um, 88, when, I'll never forget when the, when the announcer said, um, ladies and gentlemen, gathered before you today are the greatest athletes in the world. And that's when it hit. And that's when I remember thinking, we're here and it's now and I'm ready. Oh. And then uh, we had the option of getting, of either going up and sitting in the stands or getting out of the, uh, the, the track if you'd already marched and lined up. And I remember thinking, where's the bus? It's down to business and I want to get back. And, and so, yeah, that, I'll never forget um, just, just hearing that. Um, and I watched the closing. We were back in New Zealand, and I watched the closing ceremony, just crying, because <laughs> yeah, wow, you, you just knew what it was, what the athletes were going through, and um, yeah, it was uh, it was everything happened on that day. I, I remember talking with Arthur Lydiard before we went. Wow, and I know Rod, you you must have spent a, a bunch of time with him, but he was someone that. Uh, you know, unfortunately, he's he's gone now. But um, just taking on his words of wisdom and just having that one day to be ready for, and um, so it was a. There wasn't any looking around this time. No, you know, walking around the village. No, it was the pool, my room, and that was, you know, and our, our team, and that was pretty much it. That's it's an amazing common theme that that we've heard from sort of Hamish Carter from from Philippa. Um, uh, Baker, where she won her uh, lightweight world championships and things like that. Um, it, it, and it's sort of, I mean, I obviously can't own your experiences, but um, I actually watched the 2012 opening 
uh, sitting on the bed with uh, a very ill Jack Rolston, and and he he talked uh, me through it moment by moment, and talked about his experiences and his Commonwealth Games experiences, and of course told the story of Kerry Roger uh, telling Prince Charles that Di was quite good looking and. You know all, all sorts of crazy stuff like that um but but you know you could see that he had just um you know honored those experiences as well in the in the 200 final what what lane did you start in i was out in lane one so i was i was seventh fastest mm -hmm. or seventh qualifier second to last um so way way out on the outside which was a blessing in disguise quite frankly yeah. yeah. So, so it's four lengths uh, of a fifty yep. meter pull, uh, which fifty yep. meters is a long way in and of itself. Um, <laughs> it, it's two stroke, which I don't understand why anyone would choose. You know, every time I, I feel like I've been waterboarded when I when I have a crack at that. Um, <laughs> and, and and so the rate the race goes, mm. and you've obviously got less references. Than you'd have if you were swimming in in, in, in the middle lanes. How do how yeah. do you how do you know that you're going well, or, or do you know that you're going well, or are you just swimming in your lane? So you're you're <laughs> sticking on onto a pace. Uh, we, we the the objective was to swim the first lap in 28 seconds, and and that's what I trained to do was was to go 28 seconds and then 30 30 30 for the following three. Uh, and then half a second per turn, uh, doing turns the, the old fashioned way, uh, was gonna come up to two minutes. And we thought two minutes could win a medal. We had no guarantees of that. And, and so why I, why I mentioned that I was, I think I, in hindsight, I was fortunate being in lane one is because when the first three guys in the middle lane, in the middle lanes took off, I, I love to chase. Uh, I'll go after someone and just, uh, just to see if I can foot it with them. Unfortunately, I couldn't see them. Uh, they right. were they were gone. Uh, and and so when you, it's kind of like yachting as far as when you can, on backstroke, when you can see someone out of your peripheral vision because you're never looking, but when you can when you can see somebody's arms, you know you're ahead of them. Uh, sorry, not yachting, rowing. When you're yep. watching a rowing a regatta, a regatta. Um, you can see that that those arms you know at that point i've got to be ahead of them uh, but again not not focused on that that particular point just focused on keeping the head still keeping just the, the tempo up um, you're hurting at that stage um when i came off the third turn i accidentally saw the scoreboard which you never ever do you never look for the board um, and I saw I was in fourth place, and I remember thinking someone's got to die, but it's not going to be me. Um, <laughs> just, just go. Yeah. So, 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 you know, I'm I'm familiar with watching what happens. You know, it's a bit, it's a bit like the athletics. I've been watching the NCAA athletics champs, mm. and yeah. um, if you want to see a, a stunning individual performance, Ab Abby Steiner in the two hundred. Uh, was amazing setting a new NCAA record, but in the four by four, stunning, right. just just right. absolutely stunning. Um, but watching those guys cross the finish line, then look at the scoreboard to see what their time was. Um, right. sw swimmers to me half time looks like they just about break their necks off to turn around and find out where the scoreboard is. Um, did did you know you were third, or did you have to look up and go? No, when when I came in, when I hit the wall, all I can all I saw was just an instant flash at the top of the board because I was in lane one, so I was at the top of the scoreboard. Right, uh, and I saw just two flashes. Uh, there was there was a flash up the top, there was a flash in the middle, and because you 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 were down the far end, and at that stage that's really starting to throb. So I remember my eyes were a little blurry, but I saw lane one, P Kingsman NZL dot 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 three. Wow. And it wasn't until I was getting ready for the medal presentation that one of the uh, Radio New Zealand reporters, um, who shouldn't have been anywhere near us, but, but as, as, as the athletes know, Radio New Zealand journalists just have a way of turning up places they shouldn't be. And they're quite confident when they're there. And uh, I'll never forget, he said, um, that was one of the greatest races I've ever seen. And I said, thanks. And he said, we didn't give you a dog show. I said thanks, and he said, "You know how close the fourth guy was to you." 
And I, I said, I don't care. Yeah. He, he said, the fourth guy was four one hundredths of a second behind wow. you. And, and what's interesting is when we, when I replayed, when I looked at the video after I retired, so this was back in 91, mm -hmm. uh, I saw the guy who came fourth to me actually looked on his third to last stroke and on his final stroke. And that, and he saw me on his third to last. And if he hadn't have looked again, his arm, his finger was coming out on his last stroke before mine. Uh, if he didn't look again, he would have he would have gotten bronze, and so that's what that's where I where I'm speaking now to different groups about distraction proof. We we license the term distraction proof, um, and and talk about just what getting distracted and and taking a look around, you know what that does. So and then that's why I have right. I just have tremendous. When I saw you, I will never forget. Uh, watching you in the in New York in that in that marathon when you run when you guys run that far and and incidentally I all I did one marathon years later and I now then I realized why marathon runners are always so grumpy <laughs> they're, all, they're always so tired I get it now but I remember around the games village we used to think gosh those marathon runners are a grumpy bunch and it's like now I know I get it you guys are in, you guys are tired um but just seeing that that discipline to to not look around um, and never forget that that finish of yours, just the, the exaltation at the end of that. Uh, that was that was that that image of you that morning. I will never forget that. Will that seared into my mind? Uh, it was just a wonderful image, and it wasn't until my Olympic experience and running my first and only marathon that that you must have gone through just so much pain uh, winning that thing. Yeah, yeah. I always call it the roller coaster, you know, because you know it, sometimes you think I'm floating along here, and then the next thing is you're struggling, and then there's then you you suddenly step in a, a pothole, or you you, you right. go too close to the corner, and somebody hits you, and you, so you've got to. It's like a game of chess. You've got to have a. You've got to have ten, fifteen moves ahead in your mind where you're going. Right. You've got to study the road and. And, and people would often say to me, what do you think of for all that time? I said, you're thinking of something. It just had every, every second you're thinking of something and, and monitoring and, 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 and correcting and, and making sure that you don't do this or don't do that. And so it's just incredible. A, fa a very fascinating event. I wasn't, I was a good, mm -hmm. I, I did a couple of good ones, but you know, I was fascinated with, you know, Dave McKenzie, who from the West Coast won the Boston Marathon. And Jack Foster, right. the great legendary right. Jack Foster, who was that silver medal in, in Christchurch 74. And I was just fascinated listening to those guys. And that fascination drew me to want to run it. So that was the right. inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for Philippa and, and, and Paul, I mean, you both were incredibly young. I see that I, I, I did some triathlon and, and I figured the best way was to go and jump in a, in a, in a group. And it happened to be with Rick Wells and uh, Rick's acerbic tongue. Uh, <laughs> he, yeah, he, he wasn't he wasn't uh, often positive, let's say. And uh, <laughs> he was he was a really good newspaper reader. You know, the group would be sitting there at the end of the pool, and he go, "Oh, you guys want something?" Um, but but he was actually he, he actually very good, and a lot of time for him. Um, but he he talked a lot about Hilton Brown. And mm. so, so Hilton was your main coach. Philippa, who, who was yours? Um, so I had a Swiss guy by the name of Ryan Agulcher, who um, we had a, a um, very, very good group of female swimmers in particular in Christchurch. Yeah. Um, I can't remember how many we had at the Commonwealth Games, but there was, was actually quite a number of us. Um, but yeah, he, he was, um, he'd come to New Zealand in 1986 and um, it taken a few of us right through. So, yeah. But of course I knew Hilton um, because Hilton was the head New Zealand coach for quite right. a number of years and um, amazing guy, um, lovely guy, and um, obviously a brilliant swim coach. So, so what, what made him good? I'm sorry? What made Hilton good? What, what, 
what, what was it about him that, that would get you as a 15 year old to a Commonwealth Games? He had a way of instilling confidence in you. Uh, he had a way of of talking with you where you just knew he, he got you. Um, he he listened, but he wasn't going to allow you to be overawed by any, any circumstances. Um, very down to earth, uh, but knew how to get the job, knew how to get the job done. Um, and, and I remember, you know, during our, during our 1988 buildup, um, it was always on the day. And, and that was, that was, you know, really our mantra was, was no regrets. You can never control what's going to happen on the day. Uh, you can never control what seven other finalists are going to do. But, but he was always, hey, no regrets. We want to know when we line up, we've done everything we could. What happens going to happen? Um, and he always knew how to motivate people differently. I think even on the New Zealand team, he knew how to talk to, to individuals differently. Uh, he knew how, for instance, when I was training in an age group team, he knew how to tell 90% of that squad, get your heads down, bums up and get on with the job. <laughs> He'd come along to me and say something like, this is probably going to test you. Not sure how it's going to turn out for you. And to me, that was like, let's go. And, and so he, he, he knew that, like, as soon as he said that, it was like, okay, game on. Uh, so he knew how to, you know, just, just how to get the, the best out of everyone. And, and Rod, I've got to laugh with, with, with Rod being a coach for Fiji because Hilton couldn't get accreditation onto the pool deck in 1988. Long uh, political story, um, fascinating story in certain uh, instances, but um, to, to, to cut it short, he couldn't get on, it couldn't get on pool deck. And on my flight, when I was flying in from uh, Tokyo to Seoul, uh, Artie Shaw, who was one of the head FINA officials, also a New Zealand official, was on the flight. And Artie walked down the back of the back of the plane and he, and he, we bumped into each other. He said, cause he was obviously going to Seoul. And uh, he said, how's the buildup gone? I said, the buildup's gone great. He said, are you meeting Hilton? over in Seoul. I said, yeah. He said, everything's okay. I said, we've got one problem. We can't get him on pool deck. And Artie was like the godfather. And it, it, I mean, if Artie said something, it was going to happen. And, and so Artie put his hand on my shoulder and he said, just leave it with me. He walked down the back of the plane and I didn't know, but also at the back of the plane was the Fijian swimming team. So he, about 15 minutes later, Artie comes walking back up the aisle, puts his hand on my shoulder and says, it's taken care of. It's like, what? I mean, we're 35,000 feet up in the air between Tokyo and Seoul. And, and it's like, it's taken care of. So we saw each other at the airport and he said, the Fijian team were down the back. I've got Hilton coming on as a Fijian coach. <laughs> and I said, what did that cost you? He's like, the best bottle of beer is Hilton Brown's ever going to find. <laughs> so it cost us a bottle of scotch, but he came on as a Fijian swim coach. So you, you have something in common there as well. Classic. <laughs> um, so so yeah. obviously you guys, it sounds, sounds to me like being surrounded by uh, a group of amazing athletes um, having having amazing coaches um, were, were there also people you kind of aspired to be like were they people close to you or were they people sort of further out in the athletic world uh, who wants to go first on that one was that, was that, was that true, one? You, can, you can start there what was sorry so two quick questions uh, okay so two, and so Yep, no, go, you go. Yeah. Um, so for, for me, it was, I was never uh, wanting to, to emulate an athlete, uh, so to speak. I was, I was aware, I mean, I'd been motivated. I, I'd seen, I'd, in Chariots of Fire for me was the be all and end all of, of seeing an athlete I really aspired to with Eric Little. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and especially when you learn about this, the latter half of his life with going to China, being a missionary and just really going into anonymity and, and serving people. Um, and, and so his life I, I loved, and, and that was one of the, one of the huge motivators behind being a jail chaplain back in California wow. uh, for 15 years and working in Orange County jail was, was Eric Little's life. 
Uh, but I, I think as far as athletes go, I, I never really, you know, had an athlete that I that I personally looked up to and thought, you know, that's where I want to be. Um, because I always thought if 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 I'm going to want to be there that badly, I'm I'm going to get there that badly and be that person. So you know that I guess you could. It sounds like inner arrogance, but that's. That for me was, there are memories though, as I mentioned, Rod's run, John Walker's 1974, we'll never forget, we'll never forget that in uh, in Christchurch and Mo um, Walker's Montreal, um, Montreal, 76, yeah. um, yes. seeing, just seeing that, seeing that look, um, Ali Rowe, uh, New York, New York Marathon. Yes, um, Boston and New York, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is so which, images, images for sure. What which which pool did you train at in Auckland? Uh, Cameron Pool, uh, yeah, Cameron Pool, and and so there was a twenty-five meter pool, and which was short course compared to swimming uh, in Seoul, and and so we used to travel out to Papakura Pool, and and swim there. I, I would and I would always have to have lane one because I would never put up any backstroke flags because. I mean, the, 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 there's Papakura public hours. The, the Olympics were whatever, but this is public swimming time here. Like this is a typical kind of Kiwi, uh, Kiwi way, which toughens you up, I think. Because yeah. when you're swimming backstroke, you can't see anything. You just bang into people until they get the story. I'm not shifting lanes. Yeah. So one of us is going to have to move. Um, but yeah, primarily uh, Cameron Paul. Um, and and so that's where Hilton and I did, you know, the, the bulk of, of the work before Seoul in 88. I was also swimming at UC Berkeley on a swimming scholarship at Cal. So in 1988, of course, when you arrive at the Games Village, you've been on a swim team with Swedes, with English guys, uh, with Irish guys, uh, Norwegians. And all of a sudden, you then split up as a college team to meet in Seoul, Korea, all wearing different you know, all wearing different uh, nationalities, all representing different countries, which was a unique, um, fun experience to go through. And then, of course, four weeks later, you're back at, at UC Berkeley swimming NC2A competition, at swimming NC2A dual meets in, in the same team. Did, did they get sick of you wearing your medal all around the campus? <laughs> no, I never, I never, uh, I never wore my, my medal around the campus. I use it uh, when I'm speaking and I... People take photos of it, and they can wear it. They can. Uh, no one's ever asked to put on the swimsuit. They always want to put on the uh, put on the medal. <laughs> you, 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 you're not even at a disco with your buttons open. <laughs> no, no, they, no. Trust me, I've I've had enough people. Like I, it was one funny thing with being a Kiwi. Uh, it wasn't long after 1990. Of course, you tell yourself you're going to stay fit. You're going to stay trim. You're going to keep working out. And that lasts till about Thursday. And, and then, you know, you're walking down Queen Street. I'll never forget. And a guy came up to me with his son. And this was probably, probably uh, April, May 1990. Um, and he said, hey, I just want to say you did a great job for New Zealand. And I said, thanks. He's like, boy, you've packed on the weight size. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> I thought um, only in New Zealand. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Why did you choose backstroke? It, or is that because you know? I, I was going to say actually, if you ever, if you ever can't afford the tickets to you know the fight nights, you know those boxing fights, just go down to the Olympic yeah. pools at Newmarket and watch the fast lane for a while. Yeah, um, with a couple of punch ups a day. Um, yeah, but, but but why backstroke? Um, 1982 Australian age groups. I wanted to go. I was uh, 14. We thought I could qualify for the 82 Commonwealth Games, and the plan was to qualify on the 200 IM. And and so we went to the Australian age groups in in Brisbane, with a plan to win the to, to, wanted to win the 200 IM, qualify for the Commonwealth Games. I came third in the 200 IM, but I won the 100 backstroke. And, and so I was closest to the Commonwealth Games time in the 100 backstroke. I always loved IM, uh, but, but backstroke made sense. So 
you know, it wasn't anything, you know, highly strategic regarding my body shape or anything, you know, anything like that. It was just, this is it, it's backstroke. And, and so, okay, stayed with that. It's one of the reasons like with, with what uh, Philippa used to swim, uh, longer distance stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I always admired some of the stuff, you know, you were doing and, and the miles and, uh, that well, that was impressive. I could not do that. <laughs> so, yeah. so for the swimming community, Philippa, ninety six, I think, Daniel Loder um, won his two golds. Uh, what's it? Two hundred meter free and four hundred meter free. Um, mm. We we have a way in New Zealand of I think depreciating something by going oh there must have been it must have been a downtime for the other countries which is a really stupid way of thinking. Um, but he also had a, a coach I only met once, um, and you told me a story about about his training methods. Do you want to repeat that one? <laughs> Dunk and Mang. Oh my goodness, Dunk was an absolute legend. Um, um, large man, and he had some issues with sleep apnea. So um, I remember going down and training with um, with Duncan uh, at times, and uh, yeah, he would <laughs> we'd be there at the pool at um, 5.30 in the morning and, and we'd do our warm-up and Dunk would just sit on the sideline and he would, as long as people, as long as he could hear people swimming, he could hear the splash, 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 he'd just sleep. But of course, <laughs> as soon as people had finished their warm-up and the pool would go silent, all of a sudden they'd wake up. So what they used to do it was quite ingenious. What they'd do was they'd just they'd get to the end of their warm up, you know, a thousand meters or whatever it was, and they'd just keep splash, splash, splashing <laughs> on the top of the water. So Dan could just stay asleep. <laughs> but I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> and of course, the first time I came across this, I'm sort of thinking, what the heck? But yeah, they <laughs> they just figured out how he worked. Um, but yes, I mean it was it was actually quite quite an honor because for me. Um, watching Paul and Anthony in Seoul was incredibly inspiring um, for a whole generation of swimmers. And there was a, a group of us coming along sort of around 88. It was just a year or two too early for us. Um, and to see Paul win his bronze, just the most superbly executed race plan. Um, and we all knew how brilliant he was, but... Um, you know, to see him get up from lane one was just the sheer excitement of it was just amazing. Um, and then, of course, to watch Anthony a couple of days later and yeah. all the heartache he'd been through with his dad dying, yeah. and it was just right. amazing too. Um, and, and they truly just inspired a whole generation. Um, and, yes, so then in 1990, Danian started swimming, and um, that was his sort of debut as a 15-year-old. And we all saw the brilliance then, didn't we, Paul, of, you know, what was to come. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then to yeah. be on pool deck in 92 when he won his silver medal was um, just a special, special time. And and then I wasn't in Atlanta, but, um, yeah, to watch on, on TV, to see him win two goals is just extraordinary. Yeah. So it was, it was an amazing time, really, in New Zealand swimming. And swimming is mm. a sort of sport that, that people don't really pay a lot of attention to, Um other than that sort of quadrennial Olympic year. So, um, yeah, Paul, you're amazing. <laughs> just, just, oh, yeah, we just, um, yeah, you really did inspire thank a generation. You. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I have fond memories of you on that team too, Pip. And with the, <laughs> it, it was, you, you're right, it was a, it was a unique, it was a neat time. Um, yeah. And, and of course, you know, I'd, I'd seen I'd seen Gary Hurring, and then Gary Hurring came back in '84, and then '86, and um, yeah, then 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 '88 took place, knowing that '90 was going to be a neat time for everyone on that team being in Auckland, mm. and and so it was fun just seeing you know a larger team, just the dynamics and 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 what that was like in front of the home home crowd. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I have a theory about the 1990 Royal Family because Ryan was, uh, well, let's say conceived that year. Uh, but so so were remarkable 
amount of what are currently like Tour de France riding athletes and and all of this. And I clearly I'm I'm not going to think that that's genetic. Uh, I I hope that's not the transmission. Um, but um, I actually think it opened up a range of sports to the parents of those children that they probably hadn't considered their children becoming involved in. Uh, mm in the following years and 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 it was almost the final straw that broke New Zealand uh, particularly from a male perspective but 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 not only it broadened things uh, for men and women from breaking the ho whole cricket and rugby hold and said you know what wow this is exciting as I said earlier with with Ethan on Gary Anderson commentated by Craig Adair uh, just tremendously yeah. exciting time yeah. and that song that was horrible at the beginning of the fortnight, uh, <laughs> everyone was singing by the end of it. Um, yeah. And, and um, that was neat. So from from the three of you, like, it, I, I think, Rod, you said a couple of weeks ago that you can't think of anyone who has got to the top for whom it's been easy. Um and, and you know, even hearing about this young lady Abby Steiner, you know, running when the the NCAA's and how last year she'd done her Achilles, and um, mm. how as a young person that time frame seems forever. Um, so, would you would you guys still recommend that that children and young people go into these arduous sports, Philippa? You're just that you're on my left. <laughs> Gosh, I think I, I think things have just changed so much in the last twenty to thirty years with professionalism. Mm -hmm. um, oh, look, I I do. There's a I think there's an intrinsic motivation that comes from overcoming adversity, and it. I don't know. I think when children are given money or rewards for doing well at school or for breaking records it takes some of the joy out of it and there's something really special about um achieving and you know we we used to joke about um what's fun um you know it's it's not necessarily fun for 99 percent of the population to be swimming up and down a black line for four or five hours a day <laughs> um and missing birthday parties and all of that and getting up at a quarter to five in the morning but there's such a sense of satisfaction and achievement that comes with, you know, being given a really, really brutal training set um, or, you know, goal times in a race and actually achieving that, that you can't, it, it's, there's a deeper joy and satisfaction than just doing something that's easy and that's readily achievable. Right. So, yeah. Uh, it was brilliant, brilliant, Philip. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, certainly, um, I'm. I'm. I don't like the word sport, even in the elementary school. So from kindergarten through to ten years old, I don't use the word. Um, I use ABC, agility, balance, coordination, run, jump. Mm. I just want to get kids moving, uh, and. <laughs> And I know through my experience that I just want, I had so much fun at school playing cricket and rugby and soccer and basketball and doing everything. But it wasn't until I was 13, 14 that I suddenly realized, I think this running thing is going to be great. I love it. And that's telling me what to do, where to go. I just went off and did it and, uh, and then was inspired by, some incredible people. I mean, I was very, very lucky uh, here in Nelson, uh, Harold Nelson, who went to the 1948 Olympics. Uh, and in 1950, he won the, the gold medal and the silver medal for the uh, three mile and the six mile. So the, he was our inspiration. Gary Williams, who was the uh, principal, uh, the uh, athletic director at Nelson College for boys. Um, he was a five time uh, cross country champion, New Zealand. And Australia. So those were the people that inspired me. And it really, with all due respect, wasn't my mum and dad uh, telling me what to do or where to go. So, yeah. 
would you do a little game pool? I would, but but not for an Olympic bronze medal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I would do it. I would do it. Um, I would do it again because it would come naturally, uh, you know, to, to what both uh, Philippa and Rod have said. It's when you when you can feel you've just got that feel and that that desire to to see what could be, and um, this it's one of the things you know that un, that unfortunately, fortunately, whichever way you look at it, in New Zealand, I think we can take a little bit for granted where we have access to you know, to fields and running tracks and all those kinds of things. Uh, you know, up here in the US, it's just, it's not that readily available. Um, now, the flip side of that is down in New Zealand, I'd also argue that, you know, unfortunately, the athletes have got to, to grind and grind and grind. And many athletes, you know, like Rod or Ian Ferguson, Paul McDonald, you know, they'd, they'd, up, up here, they'd be revered. Um, down in New Zealand, on the on the on the other hand, there, you know, you're still having to, to grind stuff out. But then with that comes the just the genuine humility and 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 those kinds of features about the Kiwis that that you know I, I just I, I love. Um, so yeah, I mean, to to Rod's point, interesting about the ages of 13 and 14. Matt Biondi was a guy I swam with at Cal, and Matt was an 88, of course, and won seven Olympic medals. Well. Matt, what Matt was told to swim as a punishment when he was 13 for mouthing off to the to the next door neighbor's kid. His dad said, you're going to play water polo and you're going to swim during the summer. Well, that's when he started. Yeah. And I, I think those those skill sets when kids are younger and just getting them that that rhythm, that balance, all those kinds of things are important. Uh, but I, but I, I like to what, what Philippa said about uh, just seeing how how good you can be. Yeah. Um, I think unfortunately in New Zealand, and it may be changing where the thought is, if you have a bigger piece of the pie, I must have a smaller piece. Uh, therefore, we should legislate to, to you know, possibly penalize. Up here, it's different. But I, I think it's slowly, it's slowly, it, it's getting better there. Um, but I think every athlete, you're going to find that competitive nature. I, I know when I when I was out mowing the lawns, I was timing myself like how how and it felt great just mowing that strip flat when it was standing up, and and being and beating last week's lawn mowing time. <laughs> so it's I, I think in New Zealand, it's, uh, you know that's it's that nature that comes out. Um, I think there's a load load more talent in that country. Uh, a ton more talent. It, there's got to be when you look at some of the other teams out there. Um, so hopefully, Rod, with you know programs like you're you're getting involved in, you know you, we're going to see more of it just bubble to the to the top. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so you, been, you, yeah, sorry. you 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 chose um, quite a university to head off to in terms of the the history of Berkeley, and um, I, I bumped into a, a gentleman in. Hawaii a few years back and I said you know tell me your story and he's a it's like the older fella and he said and he had tears welled up in his eyes and he said well I was at UC Berkeley when Ronald Reagan sent in the National Guard uh, and you know so you had all that sort of 60s things which which clearly must still be a part of the the history of the place but so so why go to the US to study and what's the nature of that experience? So, and that's a great question. Uh, it's interesting because I was talking to a Kiwi swimmer. Uh, he and his, his folks called me a couple of weeks back. And, and I think uh, what, what happened in New Zealand, well, it might have happened in other sports too, but uh, one, of the, one of the periods of time we went through in swimming New Zealand a lot, but when when uh, Anthony and myself came over to the US, a lot of swimmers, a lot of coaches saw it as the next step of progression. Right. And while it can be a very helpful step, we looked at it as more a horizontal step. For us personally, it suited really well. It doesn't suit everyone, um, and and it does. New Zealand's a it's a long way away 
from up here, obviously. And now back when we came up, there was no internet. There was no Zoom call. You were paying eight bucks for the first minute and seven bucks 50 every two minutes thereafter <laughs> for phone calls. It was, it was tough. Yeah. Uh, and and you, it, it, it toughened you up because you couldn't just go home if you were homesick or sick. And, and so, but unfortunately, I think, um, you know, people looked at it like you, you had to do this to be a, a, a great swimmer. And I don't think that so much was the case, but I think we do have to be aware of, of how competitive you need to be on an international scale. And, and when you are talking about Olympic level, whether parents like it or not, <clears throat> you've got to be aware of world ranking list. You've got to be aware of what the Germans are doing, what the Russians are doing, what the, what the Brits are doing. And, and so when you came, when I came up to Cal, uh, it was all of a sudden you're on a team, you got 24 guys doing, just head down doing one job thoroughly. You're going to school as well and you're getting an education. And it really, I remember a, a, one of the coaches came up to me in a weight room when I first got there and I, I just finished doing a weight workout. I was by myself and I was just like thinking, did, did I did I miss this? Did I make a mistake coming up here? And he, and he looked down at me and he said, you know what? He said, the next four years are going to be the greatest years of your life. And I thought, nah, it's a typical US thing to say. <laughs> and but, but they, but they were. Wow, <laughs> I mean, nice. they, they really were. Uh, I met my, my wife here. Um, I, I got to swim and see different, uh, and a different approach to swimming I love uh, Hilton. Hilton was always my coach, but but just with the sheer numbers here and the competition, uh, it, it forces every nth degree out of you. And it, and it, that worked for me. It doesn't necessarily work that way for everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me personally, I know Anthony had a great time up here. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a wonderful you know, wonderful experience. But yeah, Cal was different. I mean, uh, people people come to Cal, people come to Berkeley from other parts of the US and think this place is crazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so it was a neat experience. And, and so, so I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I didn't know about the um, uh, jail prison chaplain. Uh, now, yes, the, yeah. the, the TV perspective of US prisons isn't that pleasant. Um, so, so what on earth were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, so um, I, I went to seminary, to Golden Gate Baptist Seminary, uh, when, when I was, when we first came back to the US in 2001, when I was working at Morgan Stanley, I started yeah. uh, immediately into the financial services industry. And I've I've been in the financial services industry ever since as, as an advisor, um, and I'm working for, for a large firm now working with financial advisors. Uh, but in 2001, at the church we were going to, I had a guy there uh, who had been doing uh, jail chaplaincy. So jail, you're going, if you're going to prison, you're going through the jail system. Uh, you'll go through the jail system for you know however long it takes that uh, that legal proceeding to go through and it can take right. you know up to two years and he was leaving the, the family was leaving across country and he said would you be interested in doing um, jail chaplaincy work and and i'd been leading some adult sunday school classes so i said yeah i'd let's i'd love to take a look at it well they had four pods in marin county jail um, five pods sorry there were there was a b and c there was the woman's pod and then there was what was called special housing, and and no groups, no no groups were going into special housing. Special housing was capital crimes, so so murderers, um, sexual offenders, so guys that were going to go away for at least twenty six years. I will I will just just as an aside, and this is as political as I'll get on this, but relative to the New Zealand legal system. It, it, if, if I was to come back and was asked to get involved in politics, I'd choose one of two things. These are the education system or, the, le or the, the, the legal system. Because up here where they where you mess up and injure people deliberately, you go away for a long time. They take it seriously up here. And, and so 
I, I, I went and I was a jail chaplain. Uh, every week I would go in and meet with these guys um, in special housing. So sometimes you are talking to people who are, who are going to go away for life. Um, but it was fascinating. And, why, and, and I don't say that in a, in a silly way. When, when you have the chance to just hear and listen, a lot, a lot of them, obviously, it was all men and only men in, the, in that pod. And just hearing their stories and hearing, I, 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 every time I can say without even thinking about it, every time I came out, I would appreciate mom and dad in just a new way. Wow. And, and so you see, you, you hear some, some, some terrible things, some cruel things that you'd, you've never seen on movies that have, that have been inflicted upon some of these people and they've done the crime. And they will, they will because they know they're gonna be meeting with you for the course of several months, they, you build up trust. Um, but a lot of people thought initially, you know, you go in and you kind of pound them over the head with the Bible. It was, that wasn't, that wasn't it at all. It was just listening to them. Um, these were men who had never oftentimes had another male listen to them. Right. And, and so, yeah. And the talent, the talent that you'd see go through this place, but, but, instead of going left with a decision, went right. And, and in a heartbeat, changed people's lives, changed their lives forever. And, and so, yeah, it was, uh, it was a time that I, I loved. Um, a lot of fun memories. And because I was in there for so long, I got to know the sheriff's deputies. So I knew the, I knew the sheriff's mm -hmm. department deputies and probably one of the greatest, one of the greatest compliments I ever had was when one of our deputies was was murdered. Wow! And um, he was shot off duty, and the San Francisco Police Department uh, said that they were going to provide counselors for the Marin County Jail staff, and um, the the sheriff's de deputies all turned them down and said, "No, we just we just want him." And we just want to work with Paul for the next two months it, because you become a part of their family. Yeah. And um, every time you go in there, you're aware that any, you know, things can, things can happen. And um, so anyway, long story, but, but fascinating, um, fascinating place. But I will tell you from, again, from a political perspective, if New Zealand does not get its a handle on its sentencing, Regardless of where you see anything, the, the racial divide, if New Zealand does not get its hand, a handle on its sentencing, it's going to go deeper into the issues, deeper into the problems that it's got now. Well, I, um, I think it's it, sad. I, and I, I was going to say, it's, it, it, I think what you've done there is, is, is incredible. And, and as an educator, I understand something of the motivation. Uh, although I'll have to say, it seems to me easier to go into a classroom uh, than into into a county jail. Um, but but there is something very much the same with education, which yeah. is it's exactly what I'm working on, uh, seeing some change. Right. And, and, and with some good people behind it. Yeah. Um, we talk in New Zealand at the moment, there's some talk about intergenerational yeah. wealth building. You can't build it without an education behind you, um, yeah. and, and without opportunities. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, that's that's. See, when, when I saw you at Christmas, Paul, yeah. So when I saw you at Christmas, those are the kind of things that need to be happening. I yes. mean, those where, where you where you impact them at that age. Yes, especially men, especially boys. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I can't. I can't encourage you strongly enough <laughs> to, to, to keep doing what you're doing with that. Cool. Thank you. So you're up in South Carolina. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And you've been there for a little while? Been there for, been here for four years. Uh, very, very different from the San Francisco mm -hmm. Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, and, and racial racial stuff still here 
Wow. Which just blows you away. It, it just, it really does. Wow. Um, but you yeah, must love, you so. must love the U S you still there. Love the U S I miss the Kiwi spirit. I, I miss the, just being able to do this. It's like talking to Pip being back on pool deck. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and it's like those connections where yeah. you just pick up from the last day you, you met each other. Yeah. Um, Nice. But yeah, like I said, I read the, I read the New Zealand Herald just about online just about uh, every day. Um, although they do have to drop their pricing for the premium edition, quick plug, because it should be for free. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just a wonderful, uh, just a wonderful country. And, you know, when I follow the, the Auckland Blues, and I mean, who could be happier right now? Right. <laughs> so, uh, well, Florida, Florida um, ice hockey fans could be could be happier, or Tampa ones anyway. Uh, um, no, hey, look, you, yeah, you, you it's, it's, been amazing. It, it's interesting. I mean, they talk about they, they talk about being tough up here, but it's it's wonderful catching up with you all. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, as 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 Philip has said, and I'll, I'll let everyone say their goodbyes. But um, I appreciated meeting you. Actually, uh, you, you might you might think that um, you know we're pretty casual and stuff. It was a big moment for me. Um, I don't know if I told you at the time, but uh, at, at times socially, uh, I, I I I struggle. So there's an anxiety uh, because you were late that day. I'd actually had to go and buy a second shirt because I'd sweated through the first one waiting. <laughs> Um, so, so fortunately, I found a place. But uh, no, I've, I've um, certainly appreciated the time. And it's interesting what you say about the, the Kiwi thing. Uh, when mm. my, my oldest week to, you know, had a very privileged weekend with Sir Peter Snell. One of the first things Sir Peter did was take him aside and say, "Can you just keep acting like a Kiwi? Because because Mickey thinks I'm weird." And if there's, two, if there's two of us together, you know, I can, you can help me get this actually reasonably normal. <laughs> right. So from, so from me, Paul, thank you. Yeah. Fantastic, Paul. It's, Fantastic, Philippa. Thanks, PK. Thanks, Rod. Yeah. It is, it is wonderful catching up with you. Oh, and Rod, to, to again, I, I, that poster is on my my mind and so I was I'll never forget that day and but it was just it, you were like just a neat neat person on that team and it's so cool hearing you and seeing you here and this is one of the things Owen and and I, I know we all know this but great people just don't change oh, she's a good mum too so she's a great mum I'm sorry <laughs> 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 right. I, was, I was always told by my grandfather, you can't change the spots on a leopard. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it, it's wonderful uh, sharing time with you from halfway around the world, yeah. uh, talking, to, talking to you all. So I've loved this time. Thank you. Thank cool. you. I Thank you. I, I've, got, I've got a person who takes a bit of time, a couple of days to put it up to make sure it's really honouring for you and, and, and the others involved. Um, but I'll send you a link when we've done that and um, yeah, we'll go from there. But thanks so much, Paul. Um, real privilege. Fabulous, Paul. Thank you all. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's Thank a, you. a privilege to be with you as well. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.